In the US, they are sucking the water out of the Great Lakes and the Great River System, the Mississippi, Missouri, Ohio rivers. In the western United States, they're sucking the aquifers dry. In fact, there's places in West Texas that haven't had water coming out of their taps now for nearly three months. In Australia, they're sucking the water out of the Great Artesian Basin at a rate six times greater than it can naturally replenish. Queensland has been absolutely destroyed, really, in the space of just five years. When Lord John Brown raised his head above the parapet in November last year and said that he would do whatever it takes to get Britain at the heart of the shale gas revolution, I knew we had a problem. The one thing that is absolutely proven about this technology is that it doesn't work in the way the oil industry claims. Lord John Brown's mantra when he was Chairman and Chief Executive Officer of VP was profit above all else. You've heard of Quadrilla now, of course, because that's the company that drilled and fracked in the Blackpool area, in the Fylde Peninsula, and triggered the earthquakes. Earthquakes, which obviously are not necessarily tsunami-inducing, but nonetheless, they did cause damage to properties everywhere in the world. This process has been unleashed. It has resulted in the contamination of the water, of the soil, and of the air. I don't expect, I don't want anyone to take anything I say at face value. That's what David Cameron, George Osborne, John Brown, and the mainstream media want you to do. They want you to take everything that they say at face value, unquestioningly, and don't go check the facts for yourself. I spent 20 years in the oilfield services industry with a company called Schlumberger. Anybody here heard of Schlumberger? Anybody heard of Halliburton? Yeah. Right, okay. Well, let me put a few things in perspective. The market capital of Halliburton is $40 billion. The market capital of Schlumberger is $101 billion. So Schlumberger is the largest oilfield services company on the planet that nobody's ever heard of. And that's very deliberate because Schlumberger works as a transnational company working right across the world, keeping its head under the radar. So in most cases, the only reason that people have heard of Trump is if they've actually worked in the oil industry. And I was part of a team that was going into communities in Colorado, primarily northwest Colorado, uh, to a lesser extent um, uh, northeastern New Mexico. But that team was tasked with allaying the fears of the residents that this new technology was going to have any more impact on them than the technology of the traditional oil field. And it's very easy to make something look like a great idea if you ignore all of the negatives. And of course that's what our apologists are doing. And here we have uh, George Osborne, who um, uh, last week said, I would love fracking to get going in the UK. And he's just really, obviously, following the, uh, the lead of his um, glorious leader, David Cabbage Patch. This is um, from The Sun last week. Too fracking long. The Sun, of course, the Murdoch media, really putting out to its read readers the idea that anyone who objects to this technology is uh, anti-British. Anti and we had um, Nigel Lawson in July holes this size can save the UK. I know exactly where he was getting some of these statements. 71% support fracking in the UK, no 29%. A few weeks ago, the Sun was actually called to task because they published that result when about eight people had voted. <laughs> and here, this is the Sun saying, from sleepy town to fracking gold mine, and showing how the, uh, the community has benefited with a doubling of the population. Um, prices of uh, one bedroom flats obviously being used by the oil industry have, um, what's that, sixfold there, nearest damn it. Average house price gone from 40,000 pounds, 135,000, unemployment dropped to 1%. And the allusion here is that every community in the UK that embraces the shale gas stroke coal bed methane agenda is going to benefit like Williston, North Dakota. Well, let's just put this in perspective a second because this is North Dakota, right up here. That oblong there. This is where Williston is, just on the southeastern corner of this massive shale play called the Bakken Shale Play. Well, North Dakota. North Dakota is 40% larger than England. Just that square, 40% larger than England. But the population of North Dakota is 60% of the population of Devon. It's, it's a wilderness. 
It's a complete wilderness. The only comparison is if the UK was a wilderness and you know we were going to exploit the uh, shale gas or coal bed methane reserves in this country, but the only town in the country was like Leicester. <laughs> you know, then of course, Leicester would make out like an absolute bandit. Um, and just as Williston is here. So what's happening is people are flocking in from all over the US and Canada to come work at Williston and uh, effectively destroy North Dakota. So this is how the media is trying to literally manipulate public opinion. What they are trying to achieve is what they call social license. Social license. This is government and corporate speak for public apathy. So when they say they've got social license, what they're really saying is they've actually got the general public so browbeaten and so persuaded that they won't take any action to try and prevent the agenda from kicking off. Despite all the demonization that goes on across all of the main political parties, although I'm not going to suggest that UKIP is the main political party, but this is uh, Roger Helmer, who's a member of um, European Parliament for East Midlands, and he, sit, he represents an area of the country that sits above enormous deposits of coal bed methane which, if they are exploited with current technology, will destroy these Midlands. But this is what he said. He said, I have absolutely no sympathy for the rent and mob protesters, the swampies and the Occupy movement, and the anti-capitalists and eco-freaks who have sought to hijack the Balkan protest. Every section of the social, political, and philosophical spectrum was represented at Balkan. I mean, this is the classic demonization. So here we are now in October in a much stronger position than I anticipated that we would be in back in February. And the reason that we're in that strong position is thanks to the Balkan village community and to the Balkan protectors. So, you know, really my heartfelt thanks to all that community because otherwise we would be in And when you see how the unconventional gas industry has literally raped Queensland, literally in the space of five years, and that's because they knew they had to do it before the population of Australia, the wider population, actually woke up to what was occurring. But the primary objective of the Balkan protection camp was not to get arrested, but it was to slow the progress of Quadrilla to the point where they couldn't frack. And of course, that was absolutely achieved. You know, what I've learned from people who did get arrested is that they were all, during the course of their uh, interviews, um, visited by CID or Special Branch or whatever, and they all asked, so who's your leader? This is the beauty of this movement, and this is the strength of this movement. The fact that there is no hierarchy, there's no leadership, it is individuals and small groups all doing whatever it is they feel they can do and contribute to shutting down this process. And this is nothing like the establishment we've ever seen before, because they're much more used to dealing with hierarchical organisations which they can infiltrate, get people working at the top level and ensure that what they stay focused on is something that's not necessarily too consequential. But 64% of the country, all the green areas here, are what the British Geological Societies and British Geographical Societies deem to be potentially viable shale gas or coal bed methane deposits. Now, I have a sneaking suspicion that the author of the report lives about here. <laughs> because when you look at the geological surveys, it's very clear that the shale runs right down through here. Everything you see in brown has already been licensed. If this industry does kick off, what's going to happen is those people who live in these areas, who have either the ready cash or access to borrowing, once they realise what's going to be unleashed beneath them, they're going to move. And it's going to put enormous pressure on property prices in eastern Essex, in Suffolk, southern Norfolk, central Cambridgeshire. The next well that is going to be drilled in this country is uh, in Manchester, right here. This is um, basically, this is uh, Eccles over here, and Earlham over here, and Manchester down here. It's right alongside the M62. Borkham, this is not. That's for sure. This is the M62, this is the A57, very busy roads. And um, yesterday, uh, iGas Energy, which is going to be the company here, by the way, I think iGas are a much bigger threat than Quadrilla. And in the public meeting where we were able to grill them, they actually admitted 
that they're going to drill down to the coal bed methane, and then they're going to spend another 1.5 million pounds drilling another 5,000 feet into the shale deposits beneath the coal bed methane. Well, the reason that they're doing that, of course, is because the real target is the mother load in the shale, not the pathetic amounts of gas that they'll get from these very thin coal seams. They're really going for the shale. But in all the planning applications, they just talk about the coal bed methane. It goes from Quadrilla's own website. This is what they effectively plan to turn the file peninsula into. And that's actually pretty conservative. I mean, obviously these pads are not to scale, but um, just to think of the impact, because each one of these pads would require something in the region of 3,500 to 4,000 truck movements just to bring the pad into production. So you have to build some kind of infrastructure for all of these trucks to move around on. And that's what it looks like in southern Queensland. As these wells deplete, and they will deplete quite rapidly, in the south of England, what will happen is they'll start putting pads in between the other pads. What you see here in the animation is that the frack was so carefully calculated by the geologists, the petroleum engineers, and the chemists, that the frack fluid, combined with the pressure, was so perfect that it fracked just to the edge of the target geology, and no further. Okay, that doesn't happen. That's what they'd like you to think happens, but that doesn't happen. A single horizontal section from a vertical well would not be a viable proposition in any way, shape, or form. So, from the vertical section, you literally drill eight horizontal sections, more if you can possibly try it, but on average it would be six to eight horizontal sections coming off of each vertical section at all points around the compass. The other issue we've got is the amount of water that is consumed in this process. I'm going to be conservative because I don't want to be accused of exaggeration. The industry has said that it will be on average about 4 million gallons of water per well. So let me be conservative, let's say 2. 2 million gallons of water per well for the drilling and fracking process. 8 of these, so that's 16 million gallons of water per pad. 6 to 8 pads per square mile, let me err on the side of conservatism, let's say 6. 6 times 16 is 96. That's 96 million gallons of water. Let me round it up. They say 100 million gallons of water per square mile, potentially right across the country. So we've got the issue of the phenomenal usage of water, but it gets worse. Because when they're pumping the water down with the, the chemicals, and by the way, in the video it says 0.5%. In reality, it's normally about 5%. I'm quite ready to accept that some wells are fracked with just 0.5% of chemicals, which is what enables them to make that statement. But it's much more normal that the additive content is 5%. 5 million of toxicity every square mile. And the reason that this is a major issue is because 50% of what is pumped into the ground isn't recovered. And where does it go? They don't know. Somebody 25 years ago had the bright idea that uh, if your companies added a dye into the frac fluid, then if there was any leaching through the geology, you could trace it. So guess what? The oil industry has managed to resist adding dye to the frac fluid for 25 years. <laughs> because there's no way they want anybody knowing that it's breached the geology. Because the oil industry claims that if there is any contamination, it occurs because of loss of well integrity. In other words, the cement fails, and the gases or the frac fluid leach up the failed cement and make their way into the aquifers or ultimately into the soil. What they deny is that there is any risk of breaching across the geology. But in reality, everybody knows that happens. And the reason they, they deny it is because if they acknowledge that there was any risk in this whatsoever, they would have to acknowledge that the whole process is inherently unsafe. 175,000 wells have been drilled and fracked in unconventional geology in the US without any problem whatsoever. I have absolutely no qualms about that statement whatsoever. That's probably true. But the reality is 750,000 wells have been drilled and fracked in unconventional geology. So what about the other 575,000? 
But because hydraulic fracturing has been granted the environmental equivalent of diplomatic immunity, enjoying special exemptions from our federal statutes, it's difficult for those of us in the research community to quantify what the public health effects are. We lack knowledge about the behavior of groundwater, and we also lack knowledge about the uh, trade, because of trade secrets, we don't know what chemicals to test for. We do know uh, from a study released earlier this month that drinking water wells near gas extraction sites in Pennsylvania and New York have, on average, 17 times higher methane levels than uh, wells located outside the gas patch. We don't this guy instructed the Senate in 2005 to effectively establish legislation that exempts the oil and gas industry from having to acknowledge or report any contamination of water, soil, or air process. The geology in the US is actually quite stable. You've got the major um, seismic fault lines down the Western Rockies. You've got the New Madrid fault line. Um, but ostensibly, there's only relatively minor faults around the rest of the US. This country is absolutely riddled with faults. And Forts that run from deep in the geology right through to the surface, which create yet another potential pathway for leaching gas and frac fluid. We don't have any regulations whatsoever. In fact, the only regulations that are in place right now are regulations that are actually apply to the offshore oil and gas industry and have really no bearing whatsoever on drilling and production from unconventional geology. Yeah. What does the industry do? If a farmer, or a resident, or even a community claim that their water has been contaminated by the gas industry, then what the gas industry does is it comes along and deposits buffalo tanks either at their property or in the heart of the community, and then delivers bottled water for them to drink. But it will only do so if they sign a confidentiality agreement stating that they won't blame the gas industry for the contamination, and um, if they refuse to sign it, then the buffalo tanks and the bottled water just disappear. In Pennsylvania, there was a case where a family had been awarded $750,000 in compensation because of the negative health impacts of living above the gas field. But part of that award initially contained a lifetime gagging order on the family. So even the children, who were five and seven, were gagged for life. In the US and in Australia, they have a, another abomination of a process called evap pits, evaporation pits, where the flow back of the produced water is simply poured into an open pit, a pump is put into the middle of the pit to create a fine spray, which then accelerates the evaporation process. In a hot climate, of course, this stuff evaporates very quickly. Funnily enough, the people who live downwind from those evap pits get sick. So when I asked Francis Egan, Chief Executive of Quadrilla on February the 1st of this year, what the plan was for flow back, stroke produced water, this is what he did. I asked him the question, he went. Uh, we're, we're working on it. I mean, just to put in perspective how much waste can be produced just from Pennsylvania which is a relatively recent addition to the unconventional gas industry. It's estimated that the waste that's in, been produced is the equivalent of the water going over Niagara Falls for 35 hours. <coughs> you know, where we're heading with this is water wars. You know, water is potentially, it's already more expensive than, than oil if you're buying it in bottles all the time. But um, some of you may be aware that Peter Brabeck, the Chief Executive Officer of Nestle, he's now retired, he retired in April this year, but uh, he, in an interview in 2005, stated that in his opinion, access to fresh water should not be regarded as a human right. What these guys are saying is that if you want to have access to the basics of life, you've got to be on a corporate payroll. You've got to be a slave to the global corporatist system. The MP in Kent, Charlie Elphick, has done a complete 180 from being pro-fracking in his area, in his constituency, to now saying, actually, we need to stop and think about it because I can see the potential damage to the water supply. But beware the MPs who do these 180s, because all of the major parties, their strategy is this. They know that this is a very unpopular issue 
So what they're telling their MPs is that you can be anti-fracking in your constituency, but still pro-fracking across the rest of the country. Hampshire County Council have just issued this, in my opinion, it's an outstanding first pass at uh, trying to understand how the County Council needs to behave in terms of dealing with planning applications from the unconventional oil and gas industry. You know, they're getting ahead of the curve. I mean, we need to make sure that this type of document gets to every county council around the, uh, around the country. You know, this will be part of the psychological operation to get the country to um, buy in to the shale gas agenda. You know, we, we are nowhere near running out of gas. You know, Sam Laidlaw, the chief executive of uh, Centrica, uh, was awarded a uh, £4 million bonus earlier this year on the same day that the Daily Mail ran an article suggesting that we were three minutes away from running out of gas. It's a crock. Um, the cross-party uh, committee basically said that any boom in shale gas production would be unlikely to give the UK cheap gas. That's because it's a global market, it's not a local market. Balance of trade, it's not really going to have any significant impact. There's a whole bunch of other things that we need to do to address that. Energy security, if you read the Treaty of Lisbon, we don't have any energy security because all energy resources in the EU are controlled by the EU Commission. Providing there's no emergency, then obviously each national government actually manages those resources, or corporations manage those resources, but in the event of uh, an emergency, the EU Commission has the power to dictate that those resources are put elsewhere. If we're told that it's going to create jobs, but the, there was a report published in the Financial Times 10 days ago that said that the government's estimate of 75,000 plus jobs is totally unrealistic. And the best it's going to be is maybe 15 to 20,000 over 20 years. As for the negatives, the water contamination, this is the case wherever this process is unleashed. No exceptions. And once this process is kicked off, there's no turning back. You know, this is a time bomb. And even, you're not necessarily going to notice the impact straight away. In Australia, of course, they're noticing it after just five years. But it could be 10, 15, 20 when it comes back to bite. Because that time bomb has been set off and you have no idea where it's going to hit. The soil contamination, the air contamination, and um, the documentary that was playing when some of you were coming in earlier is this is a brand new documentary called uh, Fracking in the UK, The Truth Behind the Dash for Gas, made uh, by an outstanding young filmmaker called Marco Jackson. See me if you're interested in any copies of that. So we're looking at water shortages. So water is going to become an expensive commodity. If you think gas and electricity are expensive now, you know, the water is going to be right up there. It's already expensive. If this agenda kicks off, where we're going to be in certainly two generations max is if you want to breathe breathable air in your home, you will pay for it. It will become a commodity. The seismic events, yeah. Look at the track record in this, in this country. 50% of the world's fracked have triggered seismic events. The property prices crash. I didn't get a chance to touch on that yet. But uh, in Blackpool, the property market is completely moribund and has been ever since the um, uh, seismic activity. And then just a couple of weeks ago, we had this on the BBC that Santander had withdrawn a mortgage offer for a property eight miles from Orkham. Well, somebody had a word in Santander's ear and said, no, 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 you can't do that, you can't do that, that's going to that's gonna create some pretty serious problems. So I have a strong suspicion that somebody, probably the British government or Quadrilla, has underwritten this particular mortgage. Yes. But I know that the financial institutions met in August to discuss a strategy for dealing with loans on properties in areas targeted by uh, the gas industry. So it doesn't matter how you look at this. It should, it should be an absolute no-brainer. But this is a deeper agenda. It's going right across what's happening in the UK, it's happening in the US, in Canada, in Australia, soon to be New Zealand. I think this is a big part of a global agenda to literally ensure that Peter Brabeck's philosophy of access to water is borne out and if you want access to fresh water and ultimately breathable air, you've got to be a corporate slave. It sounds outrageous today, but you know, if you wanted to poison a nation's water supply, I can't think of a faster way to do it than this. So thanks very much for sharing with me.
their game plan is that in early 2014, they will try and kick off about a dozen exploratory wells around the country. And that's why this is so critical now to start raising awareness all across the country to get local groups established, to get the people in the areas to understand the potential impact on their communities if this comes anywhere near them.